you take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter, Mark chapter 10. And tonight we're going to be uh, reading verses 17 through 22. The title of this message is The Suicide of a Soul. We're talking tonight about a story that does not have a happy ending. I like stories with happy endings, but this is one that has a very tragic ending. This is the story of a young man who had everything except the thing that he needed the most, and he died and he lost his soul. And this young man is in hell tonight. And if you die apart from Jesus and you spend eternity in hell, you will see this young man in hell. Jesus paints for us a very clear picture of the tragedy of a soul that rejects Christ and goes to hell. So stand with me, Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, Sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Our Father, may the Spirit of God take the Word of God tonight and deal with our hearts in a way unlike we have ever been dealt with before. Help us to understand in this story what true salvation is. Father, this is a, a passage of Scripture where you just put it straight, and we ask you, Lord, to help us understand exactly what you mean in these verses before us. In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people said, Amen. Thank you. We're talking tonight about the human soul. The Bible says the most precious thing on the face of the earth is the soul. And we're not talking about just any soul. We're talking about your soul and my soul. So pay attention. Jesus loved us so much that you've heard me say before, if you were the only one to have ever been born on earth, he still would have died for the salvation of your soul. In fact, Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what should a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, I want you to notice three things about this young man. First, we see here the desire that he had. Look at verse 17. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? What a wonderful desire this young man had, a desire to have eternal life. And if you look at this young man, he really had a, a lot of things going for him. I want you to notice how the Bible describes him. First, in verse 17, we see he was an eager young man because Scripture says he came running. Now, when I read that, I liked this young man right away. He came running to Jesus. He was not like many today who run the other way. He was enthusiastic. He was eager. He had heaven on his mind. But this young man was not only eager. If you look here, the Bible says he was a humble young man. He came kneeling. He knelt before Jesus. He was a young man who had riches. He had rank. He had religion. But that did not keep him from kneeling before the Lord Jesus, and I appreciate this young man for kneeling down to the Lord Jesus. 
Here he is, the rich young ruler, running to Jesus, eager to talk to him about heaven and kneeling before him. But as we look at this young man, we notice he was also courageous. Notice where it was that he got down on his knees. In verse 17, it tells us Jesus was going out on the road. That means the highway. In other words, this was in a public place. This young man ran to Jesus and knelt before Jesus in front of all the other people. Here's a young man who had a very prestigious position. He was well known, well honored. He was rich. He was young. And everybody was watching him in a public place. This young man humbled himself and he knelt down in front of other people before the Lord Jesus. So you have to give him an A for courage. But look at verse 17 again and we see he was a discerning young man. He called Jesus good teacher and he recognized two things. He recognized the authority of Jesus when he used the word teacher and he recognized the goodness of Jesus when he used the word good. He was discerning. He knew people. He knew human nature. And he saw something in Jesus Christ that he had not seen in anybody else and he knew that Jesus had the answer to eternal life. And so he ran to Jesus and he knelt before him with everyone watching and with discernment he calls him good teacher. But there's something else about him. We see he was a spiritually minded young man. Look at verse 17. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He didn't come to Jesus asking for help. He didn't come to Jesus asking for wisdom. He came to Jesus with heaven on his mind. He said, what must I do to inherit e eternal life? He wanted to know how to be saved. Now I want to tell you something else about him. On top of all of these other things, this young man outwardly was morally clean. Look at verse 20. When Jesus talked to him about keeping the commandments, he said in verse 20, I've kept them all from my youth. Now you think, about what that means. I mean, he's a young man, he's already rich, he is a, a leader, he's a ruler, and on top of that, he had all of these splendid characteristics, and he has heaven on his mind. And what we're dealing with here was a real young man. This is not fiction. This is a young man with a soul. And so we see the desire of this young man's heart, the desire that he had. But notice, secondly, the decision that he made. The decision that he made. Jesus brought this young man face to face with a decision. I am convinced that had this young man been alive today, he would have been an upstanding church member. He would have been a church member that everybody would have looked up to, that everybody would have thought well of. He would have been right here in this congregation this morning. He would have been back tonight. He would have been here on Wednesday night. He had heaven on his mind. But notice the decision that he made. Jesus brought him face to face with a decision. That's what Jesus does. Jesus is not interested in how religious you and me are. You know that. Amen? He could care less about that. But Jesus will bring us face to face with a decision every time. I was witnessing to a man one time whose son had drowned and he was distraught. And his son had made a decision, if I remember correctly, and had been saved. But that man was lost. And I witnessed to that man and, and asked him if he did not want to go to heaven and see his son again. He said, I want to go to heaven. But we talked, and we talked, and we talked, and the man would not get saved. No matter what, every time the Spirit of God brought him to a point of decision, he just would not get saved. So I spent over an hour trying to lead him to Jesus, and finally I said, sir, I'm going to go. Before I go, will you shake my hand? 
He said, yes, sir, I'll shake your hand. I said, all right, I want you to shake my right hand if you'll take Jesus as your Savior and go to heaven. And I want you to shake my left hand if you'll reject Jesus and die and go to hell. You shake my hand. And I held out both my hands, and that man put his hands in his pockets, and he would not shake my hand. I was not trying to force him to make a decision. I was trying to help him understand he had already made a decision. Every time you're confronted with Jesus, you will make a decision. And a decision not to accept him is a decision to reject him. And that night, that man rejected him. And tonight, as far as I know, that man is with this rich young ruler. And they are both in hell. The decision that he made. Now the key to this whole thing is in verse 18. Look at it. He called Jesus good teacher in verse 17. And then in verse 18, Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. Now now don't think here for a minute that Jesus is claiming not to be good. That's not what Jesus is saying. In fact, it's just the opposite. Jesus is showing this young man that he is God. You see, anyone who is not God is not good, and anyone who is good is God, and there is only one good, and that is God. That's what Jesus is saying. The young man called him good teacher. And Jesus is saying, do you understand the source of my goodness? Do you understand what it was that compelled you to call me good? The goodness that I have, Jesus was trying to get him to understand, was inherently his as God. Why do you call me good? Jesus is saying, do you understand that I am good? God. But notice what else Jesus did. He said, there is none good but one, and that is God. Now the reason Jesus said this to the young man, believe it or not, is that this young man, as good a young man as he was, was an egotist. I mean, this young man did not realize the blackness of his own heart the wickedness and darkness of his own soul. You see, the Bible says that the human heart is is wicked and desperately evil above all things. But this guy looked at himself and he said, I'm not all that bad. He got to looking at all the other people and comparing himself to them and he said, "I'm, I'm doing pretty good. But understand, the Bible says the heart is desperately evil and wicked above all things. You see, if you think you can go to heaven without being born again, you're ignorant of two things. First, you don't know how wicked your heart is. And second, you don't know how holy God is. And what Jesus is about to do is give this young man who was an egotist a revelation of the sinfulness of his own human heart. And the young man said, I've kept all these things from my youth. He said, I'm all right. But Jesus is about to do surgery on him. Jesus is going to open him up. And he's going to see that he's not the way he thinks he is. He's going to see where he really stacks up with the Lord. Look at what Jesus said. If you want to go to heaven, keep the commandments. Nobody can do that. But this young man thought he had. He thought he had kept the commandments. And that reveals his ego. God gave us the law, the Bible says, to condemn us so that we might be condemned and come to the gospel, the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. But some people never realize they're lost. They just think they're good. And fine, just like they are. Jesus went through this list, through the commandments, and and he checked them off mentally as Jesus went along. He said, yeah, I've kept that one and that one and that one and that one. Jesus is about to take him to school. Go back to Mark 10. He said, I've kept the commandments. Jesus is about to show him that he hadn't kept any of them. That in his spirit he'd broken them all. And how did Jesus do it? Jesus said to him, I want you to take your money 
all your assets, turn it into liquid cash, and then give it all away. Everything that you've got, I want you to give it all away to the poor. He wouldn't do it. You know what that meant? He didn't love his neighbor as he loved himself. He loved his money more than he loved God. In fact, money was his God. And Jesus was showing him that he was only keeping the commandments outwardly and he had missed the inward essence of the Ten Commandments. Do you understand what Jesus did to this man? He was teaching him that he was not good enough to be saved without the Messiah, without the Lord Jesus, without a Savior. And neither are we. This man needed forgiveness. He needed salvation. And there's nobody who can keep the commandments. That's why we need a Savior. I mean, we're all sinners. We're all from the same mold. <laughs> some of us are more moldier than others. I mean, some of us are bigger sinners than others. But there is none good but one, and that is God. And so he said, oh, I've, I've kept them all. And Jesus said, okay, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And that pierced his heart. That pierced his heart. Now, this was not a flippant young man. But when Jesus said that to him, there arose a war in his soul. When Jesus said, take everything you have and sell it and, and give it to the poor and come and follow me, the demons of hell started working on this young man, started whispering in his ear that that would be foolish and people would ridicule him and he deserved those things because he worked for them and he could take them and have a wonderful life. And he looked at Jesus and he saw his goodness and he knew that Jesus was telling him the truth. And so this tremendous battle began in his heart. And he bit his lip. He mopped his brow. He gave a sigh and finally, firmly, resolutely, he said, no, I can't do it. And he turned and he walked away grieved, sorrowful. Now, I want you to learn something right here. Jesus did not lower his standards in order to get this young man. You understand that? Amen? Jesus will not ever lower his standards, and neither should you and me. Jesus didn't say, well, that's all right. Come on back. We'll talk again. Let's negotiate this thing. No, Jesus loved him. It broke his heart to let him go, but Jesus let him walk away. Jesus will never lower his standards for a soul to come in the kingdom of God. You go his way or you don't go. You go his way or, or, or you don't go. And I'm telling you, if there's anybody that you love more than Jesus or anything that you love more than Jesus, then you're not saved. You may be like this rich young ruler. You may think you're saved. You, you may think you're all right. You may think you're keeping the commandments. But if you love anything or anybody more than you love Jesus, you are not saved because Jesus said, take up the cross and follow me. And that's why I believe there's a lot of people who think they're Christians and they're, they're not. You say, that's hard, Ed. That's why Jesus said, take up your cross. He's talking about putting self to death. He's saying you're going to have to die. Self is going to have to die in order to follow Jesus. He has to be Lord of all. There's no salvation by works. You can't be saved by keeping the, the commandments. This young man had a God before him, and his God was his mammon. And he wouldn't yield his soul. Well, let's see the destiny of his soul as we wrap up. The destiny of his soul. We see his desire. We see his decision. And finally, the destiny. The Bible says he went away grieved. Where did he go? He went away from Christ. He went away from God. He went away from the Bible. He went away from heaven. 
He went away from the eternal life, the very thing that he came to Jesus for. He went away. He went away from heaven. And he walked right into hell. And he's there tonight at this moment. He's in hell. And all we see is this young man just turning his back on the Lord Jesus and Mr. Who's Who became Mr. Who's Through because he, he walked away from the Lord Jesus and now he's not who's who. Now he's who's not and he's in hell tonight. He had it all. But Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he has it all, if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Now listen. If you look down at verse 21, the Bible says, Jesus beholding him loved him. Jesus loved him. Jesus wanted the best for him. And Jesus wants the best for you. So I want to ask you tonight, is Jesus Christ the undisputed Lord of your life? This young man went away sorrowful. He went away lost. But let's contrast this with the way this chapter ends. Down at the end of this chapter, we're introduced to a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. All that he had is one little rag, and he wrapped that around him. Go down to verse 51. And Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do? And the blind man said to him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Now, look at this contrast. Blind Bartimaeus had nothing. And now he's kicking up gold dust on the streets of glory. The rich young ruler had it all. And now he's in hell and he's lost it all. And look, if you will, at verse 31. Jesus said, but many that are first shall be last and the last first. Listen, Jesus will not lower his standards. Not for you. Not for me. He must be Lord. So I ask you again, is there anything, is there anybody in your life tonight that you love more than Jesus? You may be a member of this church, but if there's anything or anybody that you love more than Jesus, my friend, you are going to hell. That's what Jesus had to say about it. That's what he had to say about it. It's tough. That's why so many people are going to think they're going to heaven and they're going to be disappointed. Salvation is costly. Salvation means you sell out to Jesus. These people who practice this easy believism and think they can go on living any way that they want to live, they're not going to heaven. They're lost. If you're going to go to heaven... You have to give your life to Jesus. You have to take up your cross and follow Him. And if you take up your cross, it means you die to self and you love Him first and you put Him first and you live for Him first. If you understand that, say amen. So my question to us tonight is, is He really first in your life? Is He? If He's not, you're not backslidden, you're lost if he's not first, listen to me. You're not backslidden. You're lost. Don't be like this rich young ruler and think you got it right and wind up in hell. Put him first in your life tonight. And all of God's people.